after a day and a half, right, we're now going to be the ones who change the system over the next four talks or so. We're starting with uh, Dr. Bill Rouse, who's going to speak about how one manages and changes complex adaptive systems. If you remember yesterday, we showed a couple of slides, one of which said, and how do you do change when there's no one in charge and there's no czar? Dr. Rouse is one of the foremost thinkers and leaders in how one actually does that. And he is here from the Stevens Institute uh, down in Washington area where, is where he lives. And we are thrilled to have him here uh, to help us think through how you would uh, do technology adoption in very fragmented ecosystems, as it says here on the slide. So Dr. Rouse, if you would. Yes, round of applause. Thank you for my prompter in the back. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and share some of the work we've been, we've been doing over the years. Uh, <clears throat> We've been focused on a variety of areas, uh, some of which I'll relate, but they're uh, uh, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, uh, Alzheimer's, elderly care, uh, now population care and substance abuse. And um, one of the things we've encountered is the difficulty of change in the system. Uh, in contrast, for example, we have a whole other line of studies of technology adoption in the automobile industry. <laughs> It is so much more integrated in terms of how things make it uh, into, uh, into the enterprise. And so uh, let me just give you a quick overview. I'm going to guess that is the right one. Although the big, there we go. OK. So a bit of an overview, talk what, what I mean by technology adoption, innovation, uh, how we think about ecosystems. Uh, the different pieces that have to play together. We heard a lot about that today so far. Uh, what does fragmentation mean? Uh, how can you approach it? Um, and we're going to talk about primarily in health care, because that's, of course, the topic of the meeting, and talk a little bit about population health and the difficulty of dealing with um, our recent spate of opioid abuse, but actually substance abuse more broadly is interesting. You may or may not know the number, but the NIH estimates that uh, substance abuse costs the country uh, three quarters of a trillion dollars a year uh, in terms of about 300 million for uh, health care, the rest being for uh, loss of productivity, uh, loss of income tax revenue, uh, incarceration, et cetera. So it's just an enormous problem. But we'll get back to that later. So I find it useful to distinguish between invention and innovation. Invention is the creation of a new process or device. Innovation is creation of change in the marketplace. Until you've created change in the marketplace, you haven't innovated. Uh, so over the years, I've worked with about 100 companies in industries ranging from pharma to semiconductors to aerospace and defense, most of them very well-known companies. And typically, when I, when I start my engagement with them, they, they talk about what great innovators they are. And I go around and interview people and have conversations. And I come back and I said, I think you're more inventive than innovative. You create a lot of stuff, but you don't create as much change in the marketplace. And that's, of course, what we want. Uh, innovation may or may not rely on inventions. Uh, often it does, but not always. Uh, and technology has been adopted when it has been transitioned from invention to innovation. Uh, so we've done, I said, mentioned many, many studies in the automobile industry. And we've come up with one rule of thumb. You've, in, you've innovated when your technology is on a Honda Accord or a Toyota Camry. The fact that it was on a BMW doesn't mean you've innovated yet. Okay. When I was a youngster, we would say Ford Galaxy or Chevy Impala, but th those, day those days are gone. Um, and so here's a, st a slide I borrowed from, uh, from someone else, a reference down at the bottom. Uh, there's just a lot of different pieces in the innovation ecosystem. There's a lot of things that, that you've got to get aligned. And we, we heard a lot of discussion this morning about alignment and the need for alignment, involvement, communication. So what do we mean by a fragmented ecosystem? Here's some examples. Healthcare, 
providers, payers, regulators, obviously suppliers of drugs and devices at the local, state, and federal levels, uh, it's very hard for this system to develop, to develop uh, provide integrated care, which actually is what people with substance abuse need, but those are the people least likely to be able to coordinate their own system. Education is also interesting. We have local control, uh, but it's motivated and constrained by state and federal spending. So we have very uneven levels of education. And then, of course, government separation of powers at multiple levels. Uh, I'm leading a national academy effort right now on how would we transform the health system of the United States. Not the health care system, but the health system. And Mike Johns, a well-known uh, health CEO, is my co-chair. And uh, we've come up with one goal. We decided the goal of our effort is to uh, foster a healthy, educated, and productive population that is competitive in the global marketplace. And that if we only did that, we'd be okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but as we started to get into this in health, if, if you don't deal with education, you really can't have an educated population. Uh, if you don't deal with education, you probably can't have a fully productive population. Uh, these things are all linked together. Uh, <clears throat> so fragmentation is when the organization of production and service delivery across different stages are provided, managed, and governed by different independent and often geographically dispersed organizational entities. Okay? And, and part of the problem with, uh, with trying to innovate in this system is you've got to figure out a way for, for people, the different stakeholders, to win. In fact, in some of the things we've done, we had a rule because there was many, many choices of how you could rethink things. As we said, basically, if any major stakeholder loses in a big way, it won't happen. And so, uh, so you have to figure out ways to, uh, to do that. I'll mention some in a bit. Uh, say some fragmentation headlines I pull from different sources. Uh, fragmentation frustrates digital healthcare. Uh, ecosystems will transform fragmented wearables how fragmentation affects the Android system, the technology <laughs> fragmentation of the smart home ecosystem. Okay, you, this is pervasive, this problem. Okay. Uh, this is another interesting one. There's more than a thousand products in this space uh, uh, and how we, how we deal with that. One of the early speakers talked about having an API that would just access all of them and put it in one integrated way in your phone. Uh, that's, that's an interesting vision. Uh, <clears throat> fragmented information systems is part of it. Uh, disparate heterogeneous information systems like we just talked about with, with the health uh, record system. And uh, they've been just be designed differently <coughs> for different specialties. <coughs> One provider we worked with, uh, <clears throat> they allowed each specialty to buy the best in class for their specialty, radiology, emergency room, et cetera. The problem is these systems didn't talk to each other. And so the staff who had to do things that cut across specialties had a tremendously difficult problem. Actually, a, this is in some ways a technical problem, but the organizational fragmentation is a much bigger problem. Okay, it occurs when critical processes are not managed as an integrated system. Workflows become a complex series of handoffs. So I've talked with people in the health ecosystem, especially a lot of the government agencies, given I live in Washington, and uh, said, you know, it would work a lot better if you collaborated on some of the things you're doing. And the most common answer I got was, we just try to stay in our swim lines and do what we're mandated to do, which, of course, is part of the problem, is we need to cross swim lines. We've tended to look at the system this way, that it's a multi-level system, they have work happening at the bottom level, and you have processes that support work at the next highest level. You have organizations that own those processes, and as you probably are well aware, sometimes you go in a hospital, and every, like I used to go to Piedmont Hospital, I live in Atlanta, and every, every it's Piedmont Radiology, Piedmont Orthopedics, Piedmont, but they're not actually the same business. They're all owned by separate businesses. And so that's an interesting problem. And then you have the domain ecosystem, uh, in terms of what society wants, what the economic model is. One of the things that I found is a, a major source of problems in our system is we don't attach any value to people being healthy, right? We're trying to minimize costs 
But of course, if people are healthy and they're working and they're paying taxes and, uh, and, and, and sometimes their caregiver is now going back to work and paying taxes, there's tremendous economic upside, but, but CMS doesn't see any of that money. Uh, uh, and so that, there's a real, real problem. We did, a, we did a study a few years ago on uh, what is it worth to invest in people? And uh, we uncovered a couple of principles. One is that if the investor in people is not the entity that sees the return, they treat it as a cost and try to minimize it. If the investor sees the return, like in an automobile company where you actually see keeping people safe so they don't hurt themselves in the production line, it's easy to show the positive return on investment for that. But the difficulty is when it, when it cuts across. Uh, and so uh, what, what we do a multi-level analysis, which you do in much more detail, but this is just a high-level way of looking at it for today. Uh, innovation happens in a multi-level enterprise ecosystem context. It can't just happen down at the bottom level. It needs to happen at multiple levels. Higher levels both enable and constrain lower levels. It's great when they enable, but unfortunately they often constrain. Uh, higher level fragmentation makes lower level innovation more difficult. And one of the interesting things is fragmentation leads to many more inventions because the pieces of the system don't know that each other exist. So there's more ideas, but much fewer of them actually make it to innovation because the system's in the way. And in fact, we work a lot with major providers and I've had many CEOs tell me, you know, medicine is really advancing much faster than the enterprise can absorb it. The, the actual enterprise of healthcare delivery is in the way of taking advantage of the innovations we're seeing in medicine. Uh, so what are the implications for innovation? You can either enable or impede innovation. Uh, and uh, I find you are more likely to enable it if you actually consciously think about how to enable it rather than just stay in your swim lanes. Uh, changes involve services, process, capacities, consumables, information across all levels. There's, there's many things that have to be part of the puzzle. Uh, they can be differ different from how outcomes, information, or money cross levels. Okay. Uh, and modular changes, if you can find things where you can sort of plug and play, you can make a change and no one gets upset. Those are often the low-hanging fruit that you can do first. Uh, now, fragmentation in health. Now, I'm gonna argue that population health is an integration of health, education, and social services. It's not just about medical care, okay? And so, uh, those services uh, are, are provided, paid, and regulated at multiple levels. The rules of the game are very complex across levels, across states, across jurisdictions. Okay. Uh, the accreditation of medical schools and licensing of clinicians and regulation of health insurers do not cross state uh, borders, so the rules of the game change there. Uh, the information systems create incompatible silos. Uh, data ownership and access are complex. We heard Don, Wirk, Don Berwick arguing that we should focus on the patient, the patient first and some of these issues later, but these issues just get in the way. But there's a lot of innovations that I think can help. I, I basically, we've adopted a, a philosophy that we're simply not gonna get a single payer system. Okay, if we had a single payer system for health, education, and social services, we could think about it differently, but it's just not gonna happen. At least not happen uh, uh, in any near, near future. And so we have to think of ways to get around it. How can we operate like an integrated system even though we aren't organizationally? And so, so these are some of the, some of the issues that we can, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna elaborate. Uh, personalized medicine, uh, customization of healthcare. Uh, these, these are uh, some ways where we can actually use technology to uh, customize practices to individual patients. Um, the special regulatory science that's being pursued in this area. Uh, now, the problem, of course, with personalized medicine, it could potentially be very expensive. And it seems to be some of the things you've been talking about here maybe could, uh, could uh, cause it to be less expensive. I also wonder a little bit about the N equals one medicine. Uh, at an extreme, of course, everyone would get a totally unique treatment. So when you go in for your treatment, 
the doctor tells you, well, we've never actually tried this on anybody before, but you're unique, so we're going to give you this. I might maybe like if N is 2 <laughs> or, or, or 10 or something, you know, but, but, but it could be smaller than, than thousands. Um, then we got uh, telehealth. Uh, this is telehealth. The difference is this is where clinicians are involved with it. Uh, and uh, as you know, the, FAA, the uh, VA now allows doctors to treat across state lines, which was a, was a big innovation. Uh, the lack of predictability of how and if payers will reimburse has slowed the adoption of this technology. In fact, the, the CEOs of the providers I talk with, we work with about 10 major providers, uh, have said the, the payment system is the biggest problem we have. And the difficulty is we can adapt to what the payment system seems to be coming, but we know, or we at least think, as soon as we get good at it, they'll change it. As soon as we've figured out this new way to operate uh, with, with an ACO or, you know, patient-centered medical home, then there'll be another one, another way. And then we have to figure out how to do that. And all along the way, we're making these capital investments that in some ways are premised on the system not changing, but it's changing. So it's, it's a real uncertainty. And we've done a lot of work on how do you change uh, when you have these kind of levels of uncertainty, uh, not just healthcare in any enterprise. And if you get the conditions just right, the optimal answer is for the enterprise to do nothing. If you get enough uncertainty in the marketplace, you get enough uncertainty about what the solution really needs to be, the least expensive thing to do is just keep on doing what you're doing. Because your chance of making a major change and being right is so small. Uh, and we don't really want to have that kind of, kind of situation, of course. Uh, and then mobile health, this is having an interesting, uh, interesting impact. Uh, I didn't realize until I really get into this that the FTC and FCC, and there's a whole bunch of other regulatory agencies, not just FDA, that get into this space. Now, let's just give an example of population health. <clears throat> so we'd argue that population health is the integration of health, education, and social services to keep a divine population healthy, to address health challenges holistically, and to assist with the realities of being mortal. Okay, uh, and, and so in fact, the, the metric that, that we're really important is how few hospital beds are filled, not how many. Okay, but that's a problem, of course, for the hospitals. They've made major investments. Um, we did a recent study on transitioning from elderly people transitioning home, and we implemented uh, in this, the models, the computation models, Mary Naylor's uh, Penn Medicine Transition Care Management Program that she's been so successful with. And we looked at um, all 3,000 Medicare hospitals in the country with this computational model and at, looked at the economic equation for them to adopt this for their Medicare patients. Uh, it turns out, the, under the current policies for uh, readmission penalties, uh, it doesn't make sense for 83% of the hospitals in the country to comply with the regulations, with the policies. Okay. Uh, obviously, and I've talked with Sam a little bit about it, obviously they didn't systematically study the parameters of the penalties um, because uh, it turns out, especially for secondary care hospitals that don't do uh, cancer, cardio, or ortho, uh, they need to fill the beds any way they can. And if it's a readmission and you get a 3% penalty, that's not much compared to the 97% revenue. Uh, so, uh, but, but we really need to have more evidence-based policy, so we make these changes that way. Uh, it requires cooperation and coordination across multiple levels. Uh, uh, the handoffs across these organizations and levels provide enormous opportunities for errors, delays, and added costs. So there's a map of, of, of what we're talking about. I haven't even included drugs and devices in here, which I should. But uh, somehow, for people with substance abuse or opioid abuse problems, we want to provide health services, education, and social services across these different service providers. But to what extent you know, does the local hospital, uh, the elementary school, and social services and housing cooperate? 
I, I, my guess is that they would, in principle, want to cooperate, but it is so difficult to do that, so difficult to share information, that it becomes very, very, very difficult to, to, uh, to deliver this. I do think technology can enable that. We basically need a lot more information sharing, and we need incentives so that uh, that happens. So the work we did on, on transition care management, we had two views in this model. One was a view of the provider, and one was a view of the payer. And the two payers in the study were United and, and Care First, and the two uh, providers were uh, Northwell and Emory. And basically, in order to deliver this program, which is definitely beneficial for patients, the hospital is taking a loss on it. Okay? And the payer is getting a huge gain because people aren't going back to the hospital, so they're not paying. We had in these two different meetings with the two different payers and providers, the payer looked at the provider's view of the problem. And both of them independently said, you know, gee, we're making a lot of money by you doing this, and you're spending a lot of money and making nothing. And they both said, why don't we just split the profit? Because they could see each other's view. And I think that's part, this is, this is kind of simplistic, but I think that's part of how we get rid of the fragmentation is when the pieces of the puzzle can see how the other pieces are seeing it. And as some people commented earlier today that, well, maybe you have to give a, a little bit of the upside uh, and, and, and so that everybody gets some upside. But the other reason to do that is because if some people only get downside, they won't play. And so uh, there, there are approaches, approaches to this. Well, so what's the impact? Uh, the benefits of the patient of having a more integrated service system seem very clear. I don't think we have to have much argument or much data. In fact, most of the studies we've done with the providers and payers we worked with, uh, the trial data already showed the patient benefits from doing it. The question is, how do we afford delivering it to the, to the number of people we need to deliver it to? Uh, payment schemes are uncertain in flux, so people are just waiting with, the, with their resources. Uh, the uh, regulations are cumbersome. Uh, it's certainly a compliance culture. I, I've, I've often felt the worst place to be, and this is true more in, in universities more now also, the worst place to be is in a compliance culture laced with administrative incompetence. Okay? Okay. Uh, if you're going to have to live in a compliance culture, you'd at least like the administration of the compliance to be effective. <laughs> but anyways, that, that's a, a, big, a big driving issue right now. Uh, and the handoffs across organizations undermine effectiveness and efficiency. So for the, we just completed a recent big study of what do we know about substance abuse. The average time from when someone is diagnosed with substance abuse until they enter treatment is over 10 years. Now part of it is because they deny they get the problem. Okay? The average time from the, when they want to be in treatment until they uh, enter treatment is over a year. Okay? So what happens with these delays is people just drop out. Right? They don't get engaged. Uh, if the system was more effective and efficient, uh, I think it would work. In fact, my, my bottom line is in terms of substance abuse and opioid abuse, we do know what to do, and I think you heard some of that yesterday. We do know what to do. The question is how do we organize ourselves to do it? And that's, that's what really needs to be addressed. Uh, some of the enabling technologies we've heard a lot about, uh, data analytics, artificial intelligence. I do think that not everything is AI. Although it would seem, in, from the literature and from the marketing pieces people are putting out, everyone is an AI expert now. Uh, but there are things that are just analysis of data. Okay. A remote sensing, I think, is really very, very promising in terms of you being able to access your patients, your participants, and of course their portable digital devices that they're carrying are all part of the solution too. So I think we, we have all the pieces of the puzzle, we just need to have the will to do it. And we've got to convince some of the people who are just staying in their swim lanes that that's not going to work. We have to actually work, work across the swim lanes. And I think we've heard some of those kinds of messages repeatedly today. So <clears throat> let's just do a quick review. We're trying to, and, and I think what we heard from the meeting here, we're trying to foster innovation. We've actually got a lot of organizations that are very inventive. 
But innovation is about you know, making it change in the marketplace. Uh, publishing your journal article on your randomized clinical trial is not success from an innovation point of view. It may be great for promotion and tenure. Okay? But, but, but innovation is when you made a change in the marketplace. The system of healthcare delivery and health delivery, which includes health, education, and social services, is very fragmented. In some ways, intentionally fragmented, given our culture and our roots. Uh, I don't think we can overcome the fragmentation by suddenly just integrating everything. It's just not going to happen. But I do think the kind of things we've been talking about here and, and technology and, and, and data analytics can enable us operating as if we were an integrated system. I think we need to uh, use a multi-level analysis so we look at all the different pieces of the puzzle. I've had chance to talk with three congressmen about this kind of thinking, <clears throat> and all three of them said, well, for example, my, my main point with them was, Congress doesn't have any balance sheet. Okay, you have an income statement about what you're gonna spend this year. There's no balance sheet. It's not as if your investments show up anywhere. The fact that people are healthy and working and paying taxes, et cetera, you don't attach any value to it. Or obviously, that's of huge value. And only with a multi-level analysis you begin to see it. All three congressmen said to me, I agree with you completely, that's not how we do things. <laughs> okay. uh, but, but I do think we, we, can, we can foster innovation. I think, we can, I think we actually can have a healthy, educated population that is uh, productive and competitive in the global marketplace. I think we've got what we need to do that. Uh, it's a matter of, of just thinking about the problem that way. So, thank you. Take a question or two? Question, sure, I'd be glad to answer questions. Anybody have a question or two for Dr. Rouse? For Bill? So, Bill, I have one quickly. Mm -hmm. You've sat through some of yesterday and most of today. Mm -hmm. As you see the cacophony of what we have to deal with here on, we're thinking about drug innovation moving forward. Is there one particular lever that you, or one particular set of things that has struck you over the things that you've heard? Well, I think you need to get representatives from all the major stakeholders in the same room. And I think Don, Don said that. And is it, so, so you've got some people missing here, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, but that's okay, you can only have so many disciplines in a, in a workshop anyways. Then the other thing we found most successful, I didn't include this in the slides, we've created very large visualizations. Like we have a interactive visualization of all of New York City's health system. And so you can see how all 66 hospitals interact. You can see what they each do, who they serve, what's the nature of their population. And we have found that in those rooms, you have these amazing conversations when people have all this data readily at hand. And they can try different things. And uh, I think that uh, that would be uh, the kind of venue you could create. M MITRE, who I do a lot of work with in, in Washington, they have a room with 45 screens that are all tiled together. So when you give your talk, the screens are about from that screen to that screen, about 20 feet high, and you can have all the data sets up. All at and, once. And all at once. You can manipulate things, and you manipulate this, and you see something happens over there. It makes my heart just go warm. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of the people who are involved are not engineers or scientists or data analytics people. They're key stakeholders with important responsibilities and authority. And I, I found you, they've got to get their hands on the controls yeah. and try to fly the thing themselves and see what happens. And when and they, they pull on something on the screen in the top left to see it trickle all the way across to the right. bottom right. right. And it's really interesting when you have a CEO say to a CFO, look at that, look what's happening over there. <laughs> right? And it's not that they didn't live in that world, they just didn't, didn't see it. Exactly. And so I do think that that is a part of the solution. Excellent. Yeah. I, I have one question. Um, given the education system for training medical professionals in the 21st century, what sorts of changes have been made? <clears throat> to me, it seems like we need more doctors. We need more different types of health professionals. And I keep thinking I'm looking in a rearview mirror for how people are still rising into uh, becoming healthcare professionals. Great question. Well, John. there was a meeting I was at. Um, I think 18 months ago, 15 months ago, and it was all uh, medical school deans, provosts, university presidents, and this one engineer. 
Okay? And what they were debating was the future of, of medical education. And how can they get people to better understand things at the local level, like teamwork, but also the, the enterprise that they're part of. And there are even some really radical uh, recommendations, which the, there haven't been conclusions on this yet, but it was a good discussion. Like, for example, getting rid of the first two years of medical school. Should we really try to treat, turn every doctor into being a scientist? Are there some other things that they could learn that would help them with their careers more? Not everybody, I'm not saying that. But, but some pretty radical ideas being entertained. That's excellent stuff. Now, another thing I want to add on this, I'm, in, I'm involved with a meeting with uh, CEOs of health organizations on healthcare and AI involved in planning it. And I want to make just an interesting point, and I think it reflects some things said earlier. One of the discussions they wanted to have in this meeting was should they adopt AI? And they've looked at Watson, they've looked at other things, a lot of different things, okay? And I said, I think you're having the wrong discussion. I think your discussion should be what do you want, not do I buy that? <laughs> Right? Because if you, uh, this big marketplace has a creative discussion about what they want, the market will eventually follow it. And, and, and so it's not a question of whether to buy Watson or not, it's a question of what kind of help do you want in your job? What would actually help you do your job better? What would delight you? What would you be amazed at in terms of, of, of help? Okay, I think that's where the dialogue, I th I'm having a little impact on the group. I think that's the kind of dialogue we're gonna end up having is uh, rather than just accepting what's out there, this is a big enough marketplace and $3 trillion, we ought to be able to demand a few things. That's exactly right. Well, that's a great place to close. Thanks so much, okay. Bill, for your very good comments. Thanks so much. Well done.